Today is July 6, 2018. My name is Jason Higgins. I'm a PhD student in American History at UMass Amherst. I'm in Albany, New York at the American Legion. Joining me today is Penny Lee Deer, a U.S. Army veteran who served a 20-year career. She served as an intelligence officer in Germany near the end of the Cold War and witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall. She deployed to Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War. This interview is part of the Marginalized Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you for joining me today and for your willingness to share your story with me. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate right you I, doing it. Is it all right if I call you Penny? Please. Um, I'd like to start with when and where you were born. I was born in a tiny little town in upstate New York. It's called Charlotteville in Schoharie County, out in the western part of New York State. Very country, very desolate, um, a lot of farm country. Dairy farms that once were prosperous that are no more. Uh, what place do you consider home? Is that Albany? Currently, I live in Albany, Colony. Uh, but no, Charlottesville will always be my home. Okay. Tell me about your parents. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Uh, they were married in 1950. Uh, my dad had been in the service. He was in the 111th Airborne Corps that doesn't exist anymore. Um, now it's only the 101st Airborne Corps that consolidated when they didn't think they needed as much airborne support. But that would have been during the Korean conflict. 50 to 52, and he was at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. His actual job was a chaplain's assistant, which is ludicrous because he was farthest away from being a chaplain. He's, he could be a very bad boy. So anyway, um, my mother was from a tiny little town, and she had been going to uh, Oneonta State College, and that's how she met my father. Uh, so she was a college student, and turned out her cousin was the secretary or something and I, they wanted them to meet and she did a blind date so to speak and so they got together were married 57 years of um, as my father would say 57 years of f and f bliss so he, he they, there was torment constantly as a child I would say why don't you why don't you guys just get divorced I don't even know why you're together please do not stay together for the children so your parents stayed together for 57 years? Right. My, my mother had gone to college for music, uh, to be a musician or to teach music, probably teach music. And I didn't know that until very recently after her death. There was always a piano or an organ taking up space in our tiny little trailer. And I never got it. She never played it. I don't remember anything about it. But turns out she was actually interested in music and life got in the way. Now, do you play music yourself? No. I don't play. Uh, no, she didn't teach me how to play that piano that was there. Uh, I love music. I, uh, I sing. I can't carry a tune, but I thoroughly enjoy it, all different genres. Um, I was in the Vets of Albany Choir and the Bell Choir, and uh, music is a really big part of my life and my children's life. What did you listen to as a teenager? It was strictly... T uh, country music, old, like Patsy Cline, Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette, old. But then in the service, you you are stationed with all types of different people, and I've learned to a very diverse genre now. Okay. So uh, it sounds like you grew up in kind of a country place. Definitely. Uh, what did kids do for fun? Uh, for the most part, I... I my best friends were my siblings. There was five of us total. Four of us were very close. Like every 18 months, there was another child, another playmate. And so if she didn't want us in the house anymore, she'd just say, you know, go out. There's 40 acres out there. Go out and play. Find something to do. And so that's exactly what we did. We would play in the hay mount or go sledding or ice skating or whatever. Yeah. We, we entertained ourselves for the most part. Now, do you have a story about walking miles in the snow going to school? Or did you my my um, father did that. He worked 13 miles to go to the same school I did. Uh, no, it was a bus. Um, but it was a central school. So it took 50, a radius of 50 miles to get a kindergarten through 12 school filled with about 500 kids. My graduating class was 36. Very tiny, so everybody knew each other. 
Do you have any favorite teachers? Or? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I have um, Mr. Preston actually was my business teacher, so typing. Um, and back then, um, I probably would be go to secretarial practice, like a vocational school at the time where you took a bus 45 minutes to the vocational school there and back. So there was probably a couple of hours that you were really typing and doing other things. But anyway, Mr. Preston was my business teacher and he did not want me to join the service. He was adamant. He said, they're, you are a young lady and they're not going to treat you right. You deserve better. And I said, well, I'm going to do this. And I did. So what I would do is throughout the 20 years I was in, I would always go back to the school. He was still teaching in my uniform, looking smart, lean, mean, fighting machine, and just let him know that I'm still there and everything's fine. What other motivations led you to join the military? Basically, uh, I wasn't college material. I was told I wasn't college material. So again, I was on this vocational bus. So people who didn't go to college, you've got a very tiny little school. So you either went to college, joined the service, or you went to some kind of vocational school, welding or carpentry, or for females it was secretary or nursing. Um, so I was hoping and praying that there was something more to life than Charlottesville, New York. And so I was going to go out and find out for myself. A lot of women uh, who joined during that time frame either wanted to find a husband um, and get married, travel the world, um, and get a job of sorts, or at least have a job um, for the next two or three years. In my case, when I left, I knew I was going to be gone for 20. I originally thought I was going to be in the Marine Corps because I liked the uniform. They were very sharp looking. And then I said, Penny, you're not tough enough for the Marine Corps. Let's do the Army. The, the Air Force is kind of too easy, and I didn't want to be on a boat for, you know, a long time. And so I joined the Army, and I'm very glad I did. I would do it all over again. Did your father have any influence on your decision to join the military? Not that he would badger me about it or anything like that. No, not at all. Three of us, actually, three out of the five, Join the service. My one sister, she's older, 18 months, um, was in the medical corps in the army. And then my brother, Rick, who's 18 months younger than me, joined the Air Force. And the other two stayed home and did whatever they ended up doing, which wasn't much. Um, so anyway. How did your father feel about you being a woman joining the military? I don't think, if, if it bothered him that I was a woman, I don't, I never got that in, he was very proud for his his children to be in the service. Okay. Very much so. I don't know if that was really an issue. Okay. And so you, you joined with the plan to be career, 20 years. Correct. Now. What year was that? 1975. And so that's part of the Women's Army Corps. So right after the, the end of the Vietnam War? At, legally, it's still part of it. Right. So I got quite a credit for being part of the Vietnam era. Um, I joined in my senior year in April. Before I even graduated, I was in delayed entry and left the following November. Did you remember any of the uh, divisions in the nation about the Vietnam War? Did that have any kind of impact on you as a teenager? Uh, I, I'm well aware of the, the problems with that. I think it was so far at the end that it was kind of out of the... Uh, Limelight. Right. Right. So. It was a long. Withdrawal. Yeah. I mean, I was little when John F. Kennedy was killed, and so that's 63. That, that it was really, you know, a bad time. Of, I was a little kid. So, um, so I guess the answer would be no, it wasn't one of my considerations. Okay. Not really. Very naive, I can tell you that. Tell me about basic training. Where did you go, and what were your impressions when you got there? Um, and um, I went in November of 1975 as part of the Women's Army Corps, and it was during the transition. They stopped having us be Women Army Corps in 1978. So about three years out, they tried to started transitioning us, 
so it was all females in our platoons and our companies. However, we had a male drill sergeant. And so that was something new. And so our drill sergeant wasn't like you'd see on TV. Um, he, he treated you with respect. He definitely built you into a soldier, but he did it in such a manner that, um, for instance, he would call us if we did something uh, bad, we didn't get the standard, he would say, hamburger head. Hamburger head, Madden, what are you doing today? You know, or, or if you did something good, you were a sweet pea. So there wasn't foul language or anything. We were, we were actually treated like young ladies. Um, the PT uniform was actually, it was a, a blouse, a real blouse, not a t-shirt. You had shorts underneath, a wraparound skirt with bobby socks and sneakers. So when you marched out to the parade field to do the physical training that morning, you literally had the skirt on, you took the skirt off, put, folded it right beside you, you did your jumping jacks or whatever, and then you did not basically go around with your butt hanging out. You were a lady. And we actually had classes on how to put makeup on, and um, there was a whole, they still shot weapons and stuff like that, but you were a lady. It was, and the men were not allowed to come near you. Separated, completely segregated. Did you uh, create friendships with anyone? Oh, very much so, yes. Uh, still, I have people throughout the, my military career in different locations that we are still in contact today. Uh, as well as my children, who they grew up in the service too. And so they, yeah. As well as uh, my high school best friend was Louise, and um, we're still friends today, all this Did you time sign later. Up together? What's that? Did you sign up together? No, she, she actually, st she was one of the college materials. So okay. she went and got her business degree and got married and never used the degree and was a housewife, and that's where she stayed. So she's very proud of me and what I accomplished. What was your occupation? I started off as a postal clerk. So I went to Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. Um, it was only 30 day school, and it was giving you basic information on how to run, a, how to be in the post office itself. Um, by the time I had stopped being in the post office, I could run every aspect of the post office. I could be the postmaster from top to bottom, anything. Even today, I could go in and run it. Because we have the same regulations. It might be in the Army, but they were postal regulations. Sounds like somebody made a mistake when they said you weren't college material. <clears throat> well, it turns out that um, I had gone through 20 years of service, and when I finally got out at age 39, uh, I was given a GI Bill and at least three years of college, possibly four free. And my first semester in, in college, I failed miserably. Now, I had been military intelligence. I'd been to war. I worked directly for General Franks, and I failed college. And so they said, something's wrong here. And it turns out I have a learning disability. So I went through all of school, all of the Army, and never knew that I had a learning disability, meaning that I do not read and write, spell, terrible speller, um, like other people in the um, phonics, might as, well, might as well be Arabic. I don't get it, nor do I care if I get it. <laughs> That's my attitude now. I got through life without it. Just a different type of learner. Yes, I, yes, yes, very much so. How long were you in the post office? Uh, so the first 10 years, uh, I actually held that MOS. So it actually had its own MOS, um, Military Occupational Specialty. But what happens is when you're overseas, you actually worked in the post office because they didn't have a regular post office on base. So, but when you went, when you came back to the States, there is a post office. And so I would be an admin specialist. I'd be a secretary or I'd be the mail clerk the person who just puts it in the pigeonhole where I could run the whole post office instead. So then it's an identifier. So it was 71 Lima Foxtrot 5. So I'm an admin specialist. I'm a secretary who can do the post office. So like a specialty of sorts. So that lasted 10 years. And the only reason I switched off is I couldn't get promoted. So the whole idea with the military is they're going to promote people that they really need. 
And I happened to be stationed at Fort Huachuca, Arizona, best kept secret in the world. But it's the home of military intelligence. And so I was working in something called a PAC, Personnel Admin Center or something. So anything that the intelligence people needed done, like I would get them ready for their promotion packets. So I was promoting people, helping people get promoted to E7 that were younger than me and had been in the service uh, much shorter. And, and I said, this is ridiculous. So I put in for, I, I took a test to see what I would qualify for, and I came up with five different intelligent MOSs that I qualify for. So no, I'm not stupid after all. So anyway, so right there at Fort Huachuca, I went to school. So I still went back and forth to home with the kids and everything. And my final week of graduation, they dropped the scores, it's called. I actually got promoted as a 71 Lima as an admin specialist, they actually said to you, you, you know, you, you don't really have to go to, you don't have to finish, you don't have to graduate. And then I would still get stuck. So I got promoted as an E6, as an admin specialist, and then anyway, I graduated. And then, so now you've got a situation where I'm 10 years in service, I'm brand new to the field of military intelligence, and I have young whippersnappers that know more than I do. It was kind of humiliating. I had to buck up fast, figure out what was going on. And I had a very interesting boss, and I'm still friends with him today, but we butt heads big time back when he was trying to teach me how to be an intelligence analyst. So uh, what was happening in the service was a lot of people wouldn't get promoted, and so they would do reclassifications, it's called. So the troops that I had under me might have been artillery guys, um, tankers, uh, armor, um, uh, engineers. So they understood military tactics, and I needed to find out what those military tax tactics are. Not only that is, you have to find out what the enemy's tactics are, because intelligence, you're really looking at the bad guy, not our tactics. So anyway, the way how um, his name is Mr. Barfield, Mr. B. Um, he turns out I had, there was four of us that were all the same rank, only I happened to be in charge because of the time and service, basically. All women who had transferred as, Emma, as um, admin people, who didn't know a blessed thing about being in the real army, basically, right? We're secretaries. So anyway, he literally brought out little tanks and little artillery pieces, and we moved them around the battlefield in a game, so to speak, only he was teaching us tactics. About the time you get blown up too many times, you're going to learn that take this other thing with you rather than. So um, that's exactly how I learned how to how the, the military tactics. And these were tactics designed to fight a cold war. Enemy, right? Correct. Correct. Is this Russia the imagined enemy? The well, at the time, it was it was the real enemy. Truth, it was Cold War only, but they were real. They, so yes, um, after the Second World War, they. There was this Cold War, the Warsaw Pact, the Iron Curtain, and literally it was an imaginary line where you were the communist or Western uh, democracy. And so um, that's exactly what I was watching. Yes, it was the Russians, only in Czechoslovakia you had Russian troops, but you also had Czechoslovakian troops, and then you the Yugoslavia before it was Czechoslovakia. They separated all that. Um, even the city of Berlin was divided into four different sections. And some was communist and some was um, Western. And that particular city is directly located in East Germany that was communist. Right. So, so yes, I, so my basically, my job there was a bean counter. So people would do, they, the bad guys, the Russians, would do, um, exercise, field exercises. And so my job was to make sure that it was just a field exercise. Did they take them all home when they put them back on the train? Um, what they had on the train, is it what they said they had? Uh, so we, w there was five different ways of us actually figuring out those kind of things. Um, uh, we would actually have people close to the border, uh, up in the uh, imagery, satellite, 
communications, uh, listening to comms, things like that. And so putting it all together, it was a puzzle of sorts. And I love puzzles. So that's what we did. And that, uh, in 1989, they had the fall of the wall, solidarity in Poland, um, and then everybody followed suit. The USSR used to be 17 satellites, and now they're all individual countries, and they're all democracies now. So anyway, that enemy no longer exists. But it just so happened that in 1990, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and then we switched enemies. And all of a sudden, I have a new enemy to understand, and their tactics, the difference in the terrain. Germany is much like upstate New York. Um, to include like the Catskill Mountains and you got the Alps instead, right? Um, so um, it was completely different where when you went to Desert Storm, it was a flat nothing, absolutely nothing there. Before we get to your um, experience in, in the Gulf War, um, what were your impressions of the people? And were you in West Germany? Uh, I was in West Germany. I actually spent... Um, 11 and a half of my 20 years in Germany in four different locations. So I absolutely, I really liked European uh, people, not just Germans, but if they have a different mentality, they, their cities are clean. You, it's, it's nothing to see a woman out there sweeping her do doorstep. It's very um, respectable. There was enough. Um, they didn't take anything for granted. They remember what it was like when Hitler was there and how things had changed and, and they passed it on to their generation. They're big partiers, love their beer. <laughs> what did you do on your off time? Your A lot of time. Well, we traveled. So Germany is about the size of New York State. So for us to go to the next, um, I, in one town, I lived in Swybrook in Germany, and it was 10 minutes to the French border. We went over for lunch to France. Um, but we traveled a lot. We, a lot of times the um, moral, what is that thing called? It's like a recreational department for the armed services. Um, they did, did a lot of bus trips. And so I did a five-country square dance in a weekend. We took in five countries and stopped, got out and square danced and got back on. But my, my children have seen all of Europe. Um, some we did by train. A lot we did by the buses. It was, it was very, uh, uh, I did have an international driver's license. We could go to other countries, no problem. Except at that time, I couldn't go to the Iron Curtain. That actually happened by mistake one day. I, my family members came to visit. And so we're down in Bavaria, it's the southern part of, uh, so there's a lot of castles and it's a cool place to go. So everybody who comes to visit me goes to that area. But all of a sudden I'm at the Czech border and I can't go into Czechoslovakia. Luckily they just had me, they opened it up, kind of like a gate of sorts and it wasn't very, anyway, they had me do a U-turn and let me leave, luckily. Because military intelligence, I would have been forbidden to be over there. Well, you've mentioned your family quite a few times, so can you can we back up and just talk yes. about how many children do you have? When did you have them? When did you meet their father? Okay. It's a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in my first duty station in Ansbach, Germany, I was in the post office, and Bill is their biological father, and, and I have Megan, and I, I had Kyle. I have lost him. That's a different story. But... Um, um, so he, he was a combat engineer, and so his job would be to build bridges and then blow them up. And, but in the post office, you have, um, there's a real need, oh, especially in Europe, for a buildup so that there's, everybody's sending packages home, everybody's sending the cuckoo clocks and the stereo systems. And anyway, there's a buildup of, you have extra people helping you out who are not postal clerks. Right. It's kind of on the job training, or really they're probably more likely um, moving the boxes or driving the trucks. Well, he was one of those people. And, um, 
anyway, so I met him. I used to hang out with a bunch of guys. Um, I am still uh, very much, um, I, I get along better with guys, I guess. So anyway, I was probably one or two. I was looking at pictures just the other day. It was one or two females in a group of six to ten guys. We were, we were pals. And anyway, he happened to be one of them. I was semi-dating one of them, and he, did, husband, did not think this particular person was treating me nice. And so he said, look here, we're going to get together. We're, this, you don't need to do this nonsense. So anyway, it, so that was in Ansbach, Germany. What's significant about that is it's the 1st Armored Division headquarters. So it's about 10,000 males, and there's 20 females. Mm -hmm. They weren't all located in that base. Um, this was the headquarters, so whatever it takes to keep the, the unit going. The, it's an armored division, so they have tanks. So they have outlying units spread all over the place. So, but the, the significance of that is there was only 20 women amongst all these men. And um, again, I was in the Women's Army Corps and completely segregated. We worked at the same post office, but we were segregated, and we had our own dorm in um, a wing, and the guys weren't allowed in there, that kind of thing. So um, we ended up um, dating, and in Germany back then, um, you actually had to have permission from the commander to get married. You got counseled, and this is what to expect, and he had to give you the okay. And that took a year for us to actually get married. You, had, you could always go back to the States and just get married, or you could go to Copenhagen, Denmark, just like on a weekend, and um, get married up there, kind of like Vegas. But uh, we were fine for you know, what we were doing. And uh, anyway, so it took us a year. And in Germany, you have to get married by the, the courthouse, like the justice of the peace. You can have a a church wedding if you want, but you have to be married by, so uh, it was called a Standestop. So I got married in some place that was speaking German, and then I had a translator that said what we were doing. And um, so what's interesting enough, out of my selection of 10,000 men, I selected Bill, and uh, it turns out he's a manic depressive. And there'll be more to the rest of the story as we progress through our lives and how that affected us, the children. Um, so we actually rotated back to the States early. So I was supposed to be in there for about 18 months as a single person. When you got married, you had to have, do three years. It's called the un it's called accompanied, so that um, they're going to give you housing allowances. And there's a lot of bennies being married. A lot of people actually back then did contract marriages because they would get money for living off post and get money for foods and stuff like that. So they might be married for the three years they're there and then just get divorced and come on home. And they were called, That's what a lot of people were doing that weren't really in love or whatever. So um, I was living out on the economy. What that means is actually out with the Germans, out the country roads. And uh, it takes about 20 minutes to where we were from. But they had something called alerts. And they still do it in service today. But basically, you have one hour to get to your rendezvous point, wherever it is, because you have no idea if, you're, if it's a test or if you're really going someplace. And nobody tells you anything. So this particular thing happened where, um, I had only been married about three months, and we got a phone call like 3 o'clock in the morning for us to go in. And so um, he's driving like at a high rate of speed, 100 miles an hour, in this little VW station wagon on these tiny little country roads, and we didn't make the turn, and we had an accident. Basically, he thought the Russians were coming. He, had, uh, he was on a manic episode, it's called, and so he hadn't slept for a, about a week. Little, I'm very naive. I have no idea why he's, why he's cleaning out the closet at 3 o'clock in the morning. He probably was up when he got the phone call. Um, but anyway, so we, we wrecked, and it was brought to the attention because when they 
basically we didn't hurt ourselves that we know of. He had a little scratches and he ended up on my lap. And as far as I know at the time, I didn't know that, that I lost consciousness. We just rolled and ended up in somebody's field. Um, but anyway, they, they took him to the emergency room because he was so concerned about these little scratches on his, and, and it turns out it was nothing. He was hallucinating basically that he was going to lose his arm or something. So um, they, they realized something was terribly wrong and so they actually took him to the major hospital in Nuremberg at the time. And he spent a, probably a couple of weeks there, but he, he wasn't able to come back to work. Um, so they, dis they sent him to Walter Reed Army Medical Center where they have this huge mental health facility. Um, Forest Glen, it's called. It's actually pretty, very pretty. But anyway, so he's, he's been shipped off because he's a nutcase. And so I'm still here. And luckily, they gave me a hardship and they let me return to the States. And I was, I was in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, which is in Alexandria, right outside of Washington, D.C. Hardship. That's what it's called. Uh, so my dependent, um, well, we were both, he was still in the service at the time. And so he, they want to keep military people together as much as possible. And he was having medical issues. And so I was released from my obligation to stay in Ansbach. And I was able to go to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. So I do need to back up just a second. because So I'm in the Women's Army Corps. When you first get married, you're not allowed to get married in the Women's Army Corps. So they actually had to change my contract. I could actually have gotten out. If I wanted to get out because I'm getting married, I could have just been released at the service. And that same thing happened later on when I had my first child. You know, you can get out if you're pregnant. You don't have to stay in. And so I actually have to sign another contract saying it's okay for me to stay in because at the time, you weren't supposed to be married, you weren't supposed to have children, and the times were changing. Right. So. What year did you have your first child? Seventy nine. Seventy nine. I went in in seventy five. Okay, so you were stationed in Germany in the seventies. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's the years, first time. The first ten years you were in Germany. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. We we would go back. A second time before my first ten years. I see. Yeah, I went. I went back th three times. Okay. So, anyway, um, so I have two children. Kyle was born in uh, on Fort Belvoir. Um, oh, Bill ended up getting chaptered out. It's called kind of like Corporal Klinger, who wore the dresses in Mash. That was the separation he got because he was a fruitcake. He was he was nuts. So they discharged him because of his mental health Correct. problems? Correct. Right. that other than honorable? No, he got an honorable discharge. Okay. But at some point during this interview, I would really like to talk about, because nobody followed up with him after I dumped him, that he is one of your marginal, your incarcerated veterans that you want to interview. So you divorced? Yes. Well, we'll go down the line. Okay. So, so I'm at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and I'm actually working as an admin specialist. He is now my dependent. He's no longer in the service. I am fully responsible for every action that he does. So when he gets in DWIs, I'm called before the commander. What are you going to do about this husband of yours? He's not, you know, toeing the line. Anyway, I recall an incident where he had been drinking. He, he, is, he was a carpenter. And so throughout this whole history, it's important for him to be a carpenter. If he's not a carpenter, he's not a happy camper. So that would set him off in these manic episodes. But anyway, I do recall that, so I have a six-month-old, um, and he's drunker than a skunk, and the cops had all followed him back from wherever he was. And they came storming into my kitchen, and he's taken down, taken down by six cops in my kitchen. These are the kinds of things I lived through as time progressed. So, um, right, it was basically a, a DWI. However, the reason he was doing that when he's driving recklessly is he's he's um, he's manic. So the, he had these swings, and 
Looking back, it was probably more like every 18 months. At the time, I thought it was like every three years he would do these swings and get some medication and get back on track. Um, I do need to go back for just a minute. My son was born at Fort Belvoir, I told you that, but six, uh, six weeks he was born, I wasn't even um, back on active duty. We, you get maternity leave. He, um, I got orders for Korea. At that time, Korea is an unaccompanied tour. So I was expected to leave and leave my brand new baby with this crazy man for a year. And uh, luckily, Fort Belvoir was very close to Alexandria, and that's where all the decisions are made and where you're stationed. And so there's a little old lady in tennis shoes that ha has your whole life in her, your hands. So I did all the documentation asking for a change in assignment, not to go to Korea. And luckily, I got the right person that said, well, would you like to go back to Germany? I said, yes. And so we went back to Germany. And we were um, uh, stationed in Permasans, Germany. Um, so I worked at the post office there. My job there was in charge of if the people that have you have selling stamps. I was in charge of all those people in all the units all over the place that I would get their stamps to them. That was my job. Um, and um, when I first arrived, Kyle and Bill couldn't come with me. We had to wait for government housing or me to find housing out in the economy. So I had to stay in the barracks, my first night in the barracks. Um, so I'm probably an E4. So I've been in three or four years, I'm not sure. But anyway, so I'm, a, I'm in the barracks where not normally I'm, I haven't been in the barracks. I'm, I've got my own house outside, right? But anyway, so my first night, there was this, I came back from the shower. I'm in, it's actually, it was a co-ed dorm. So there was male females on those wings. That's how things had changed. So I literally left the showers, like in a bathrobe, going to my room. And um, there was this huge black guy that tried to talk crap to me, you know, just talking stuff. And um, I, I had enough with whatever nonsense. And so I tried to go into my room. And he put his arm in between the door, like he was going to come in my room. And I... I I don't know, most likely I got angry. You think about it after the fact that he really could have hurt me. But anyway, I slammed it and, and then he finally went away. Little did I know, he actually was the, um, the boss of the post office that I was working at. And he had literally just kicked his wife to death. He had two children, and he had gotten angry at her, and he beat her to death. He kicked her to death. And they had him, you know, waiting his uh, arraignment or trial. It had literally just happened. And they had him in the same barracks as me. And looking back, it could have gone very bad for me. Um, I recently checked in on him, like, to see what, he, what ended up happening. With, um, other people on Facebook, it's, you can actually go on sites and you know, whatever happened to this guy, and they were telling me that they remember the incident completely, and that um, he's in Leonardwood or something, he didn't get the death penalty or anything, but, um, and how ludicrous it was for this man not to be in jail. So, um, uh, anyway, so we moved from Permissance is, so I worked at the post office, and then we relocated in the same tour about a half, an hour, 18 months into the tour, um, I was, I went to Swybrook, which was right down the road, but I was in charge of the post office there. So uh, not only just the, every aspect of the post office. Um, Bill worked in the commissary. He was a butcher. That's a fantastic job. Most of the other butchers there were actually Germans, and they um, were part of like a, labor union and, you know, one of the best paying jobs you can get on post. Anyway, so I uh, went to go have lunch with Bill one day, and his supervisor, who was in the service um, at the commissary, they're actually veterinarian technicians that actually work at the commissary, um, 
for botulism kind of thing. And um, he said, Sergeant Joyce, he hasn't worked here for two weeks, but you can find him out back. He's building something. So for two weeks, this man goes to work every day, and I'm thinking he's at the commissary, and it's, he's outside building some kind of barn building because he wants to be a carpenter. So I went to the MPs, and I said, things are going to get ugly here. Something's not right. He's, he's going to go off. I've seen this before, you know, the car wreck. And he said, well, he's a dependent. Legally, we can't do anything until he does something wrong, if he endangers himself or others. I said, OK. So here I am. I've got this crazy man. Um, and about three. Yeah, about three. Um, and we lived in the government housing. And that was actually a lucky thing, because we were in government housing, because they have authority. The military has authority. And so I came home one day, and he, um, so he's on a manic thing. For, he, I guess I didn't even pay attention to the depression, or he just doesn't cycle like that. He just was normal, and then he was manic. But anyway, but you can see it coming, uh, not sleeping. But anyway, I came home one day from work, and he has, he's naked as a jaber. He's got uh, Vaseline all over him. He's in the bathroom, and he's been uh, cleaning out all the closets. Everything, every closet, every dresser, everything is, is thrown out. They, they, as they're cleaning up, they don't put it back. They just make a mess. But anyway, so my whole government quarters is, is a mess, and he's in the bathroom. And with Mannix, they potentially could, they have a high sex drive. So he was whack it off to beat the band, but he's got this common all over. He looked like a white um, polar bear. But anyway, so, so this is what we have. And luckily, he actually went outside. I do not know exactly. He did not have a shirt on. I don't know if it was an underwear or something, but somehow he got a hold of a tomahawk, like a, a little hatchet. And he was taking this hatchet and flinging it against the um, tree and semi-naked. There's not much. just But the way it's set up is just like these tables is we all have a housing area. So there's a 18 people that live in this building, and it's a quad. And so in the middle of the quad is, is where the children play, the uh, play, playground area. And every one of us being in Germany and everything so dirt cheap, we all own BMWs and Audis and uh, Mercedes. So all the cars are directly in the quad, too, right in front of our houses. So he's flinging stones and dinging people's Audis. And that was enough to get the attention of the cops to come, because he's destroying property and he's endangering the welfare of a lot of people. Anyway, so it took the cops again coming at gunpoint to take him down, to take him to the paddy wagon, to take him where he needed to go for another couple of weeks. Um, they shipped him off home again. They shipped him back. Now, he's a dependent now. So it, I basically, I shipped him back. I couldn't control the situation. I, I sent him home. I had enough. And um, anyway, the same people, so the um, installation commander came to my home and apologized because nobody was listening to me. I was crying for help, and nobody would listen to me. There was their hands were tied, and anyway, he normally, if you're your dependent, destroyed government property, you'd be responsible, and you had to, they cleaned up everything. They made sure you know he got what he needed and sent him on. But anyway, so I actually had sent him home. So now I'm a sole parent. Um, you know, you work crazy hours in the service and paying out a lot for daycare. And um, when I finally got uh, my next duty assignment, it was Fort Huachuca, Arizona. And stupid me, well, twofold. I guess it's not stupid. But anyway, I heard a song. Remember, I like music. Doesn't anybody ever stay together anymore? Probably had a couple beers in me. I call him and I said, we're going to Fort Huachuca, Arizona. He was living in um, New Jersey at the time. 
if you want to come with us, meet me in St. Louis. That was the gateway. You flew right into St. Louis, picked up another, and then we went on to Arizona. So he met me there, and that's where I, my daughter was conceived, in St. Louis, under the arch. Uh, so three months later, I mean, whatever, nine months later, I have this little kid, a little girl. And that was uh, the other thing was I had alternative motives. I wanted a little girl that looked just like my little boy, and he was my means to an end. Um, so, yes, we were getting back together. It was important for Kyle to have his, his um, dad, things like that. And, and I was trying to get him, you know, do the best I can with him. And um, so he went to Fort Huachuca, and then there was other incidences and lost a lot of money, and he wasn't taking care of the children like he was as a dependent. Like if I was working long hours, I'd ask him to take pick up the child from daycare. Anyway, I, I threw him out, finally, for a couple of reasons. I'd had enough, for one thing. The safety of the children, you know, high speeds, you never know when he's going to do crazy stuff. It was nothing for him to hang um, Kyle off a castle, 600 feet in the air, just to get my goat. He was a very unsafe person. Nice guy, if he was normal. But when he's not normal, very unsafe. Um, so anyway, I finally had enough. Somewhere along the way, somebody had told me that to get rid of him before the 10th year because they're entitled to 50% of your retirement. And so I divorced him at nine, month, nine years, thinking, oh, you're pretty slick. Well, he happened to have a lawyer that read the law that every month you're married, they're entitled to such and such. So he's in he, at the time of my divorce, he was entitled to 22.5% of my retirement. However, throughout all the years, he never paid the child support that he was supposed to for the two children. And Megan had gone to college, and so she, he probably owed her a lot of money from for 26 years. Anyway, I sued him back for child support. And we cut a deal, so to speak, that I don't owe him the 22.5%, and he doesn't owe me the 18% for all those months. So I don't owe him a dime. Not that you can tell him that today, but anyway. So, so did he maintain relationships with his children after the divorce? Um, it was very flaky. He would get... Um, so he's just recently reconnected with my daughter, and he's still claiming that I stole his children from him, that I took them off to Germany. Well, they're telling me I've got to go to Germany. I take my children with me. So he's just not clear that he thinks I owe him something. Um, so he would send letters, Christmas or birthday cards was the extent of his relationship with the children. They might, he might send a present or something, but everyday communications and stuff like that, no. No. So, um, I understand that you had child care needs. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> So even when you're deployed for training, I might be gone, gone for three weeks at a time. And so I would pay somebody to watch a child for 24 hours a day for three weeks. Basically, I'm giving their, my whole paycheck to these people. And so what I did was, at, when I finally retired in 1995, I opened up my own daycare and got recouped some of the money. And I catered to the military personnel. Uh, it was in my own home, and I was allowed to have six children at one time, but it was a 24-hour daycare. And so if they would normally, they would, the children would still go to whatever daycare they normally go to, but I might pick them up at the daycare at 6 p.m. or drop them back off at 6 a.m. And then so they still had their routine. I was kind of a surrogate, and so I was, um, it was lucrative. Yeah, so... Um, but it's hard to leave your kids. It's just, it's, I've often thought that the Women's Army Corps might have had it right for you, you know. If, what they say is if the Army wanted you to have a wife or children, they would have issued you one. So, yeah, people, a lot of people disagree completely with me. But, I mean, I did 20 years. I was a sole parent. I did a good job. 
uh, I did the best I could. And I talked to Megan, uh, my daughter, um, and uh, she, she loved being, uh, we're, they're called brats, um, army brats. Uh, loved traveling around the world, and she, she's very independent because she was a latchkey kid kind of thing. She actually was in the service for three years. Um, but she elected to get out, interesting enough, because she wanted to get married and have children, and she didn't want to be deployed and leaving that child behind with grandma. She didn't think it was fair to the child. So there's a little something there. So okay. that's, a, that's an important mm -hmm. perspective. Yep, yep. Uh, so before our digression, you were talking about the transition to Gulf War. Can you take us through mm -hmm. your experience there? Yeah. Um, so I'm stationed in Germany. And so you go through these briefings in preparation to what to expect. And that was actually when I had my first, first experience with military sexual trauma. And that's very fortunate from what I understand. So 1990, so that's 15 years in service um, that I really either didn't pay attention or wasn't taking it seriously, hadn't heard about military sexual trauma. It's being swept under the rug, basically. Women were being discharged for personality disorders when they reported rapes, things like this. So I happened to be in, a, and the story I tell is some people don't see it as significant. I was not raped. I was in an auditorium, and there was another member of the same rank as me who was sitting like two or three rows back, and all my troops are behind me, and we're all listening to the same briefing. Well, this particular person actually, um, we were standing up for the Pudge and Legions or something, and uh, he grabbed my ass. And I didn't, I, I immediately like turned around to punch him and my troops are all looking at me like, what's she gonna do here? And he's got this huge grin on his face, just like um, humiliating me. So I didn't do anything. I put my wrist down, I turned around, uh, he said, my troops said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And then I just turned around. So I thought, like so many others that hear this story, that it really didn't affect me, that it's no big deal. So I'm other, I think I've had to tell, tell somebody else, uh, another one of my, I was telling somebody about it, and another soldier said to me, Penny, if you don't report him, you're going to find yourself upside down in a foxhole. And that stuck with me. It was planted. He meant it by supporting me. But the prob problem with reporting it, and why so many women don't report rapes or other inappropriate action is, so all my troops saw all this. And how was I supposed to react? And it's like, well, tattletailing. I'm going to go to the commander and tattletale. I'm a sergeant. I'm in charge of these 40 young people. Um, so, and again, I really didn't think it was an issue. I, the guy's a twit. He's, a, he's, he's inappropriate. So I'm a firm believer in not uh, condoning negative behavior, so to speak. So I just ignore it, so to speak. Well, anyway, so, so that stuck with me. So I'm on my way to war, and this guy is going with me, like on the same plane or other people like him. So the word is out that this has happened. So things like... Sandy talked about it today, actually. These innuendos that you would hear. Um, I would go to the motor pool in preparation for deployment, and other people, it's not him necessarily saying, I would love to, to check her oil with my dipstick, things like that. Or if I'm actually having an ice cream, they're watching the way I'm actually eating or taking care of the ice cream. It was like things had changed. The, the feel of it had changed. And um, so anyway, when I got to Saudi Arabia, that's where I was stationed, not in Iraq. In 1990, well, we were in preparation for going to war. And it would have been right at Thanksgiving time frame. Um, we had, um, they're called berms. They're 
they take these bulldozers and it's just a piece of sandbox and they make it about this high. It might be higher, about 40 feet. And, and the whole idea, I was just reading a book, <laughs> that why they did this was to stop bullets. Um, but anyway, we had berms, so these mountains, they created mountains and we lived inside them or we ate there or that's where the things were happening. But we, we actually made foxholes within this mountain. And so we had guard duty. And so I'm, I'm out there and I'm thinking, how do I know that that guy or somebody like him, another predator, is not going to come? So I have an M60 with me and I have an, my M16. Luckily, most, most time there's another person with me. But again, how do you know that other person's not one of your predators? So this is always in the back of your mind that who inside the wire is your enemy? And um, there was actually an incident, nothing to do with military sexual trauma per se, but um, I, you have Constantina all in front of the berm, and we have light discipline, so there's, no, there's not supposed to be any light for miles and miles. And all of a sudden I see this vehicle coming towards me. It turns out it's, it's a very large truck, not a tank. Or, um, and luckily, so I could have fired upon a friendly. Um, luckily, I heard English. What they had done was they got disoriented and they got their axles in the Constantina wire and they were a mess out there in front of me and I could have blown them away. Um, but that's the kind of thing that the conditions were horrific, desolate, laundry. You're living in GP medium tents, which is about the size of this room actually. Um, uh, and you're, you have a cot area and um, you, you try to do the laundry in this bucket and you, they have these sandstorms. So you've just done your laundry, there, there's, it's on the clothesline, whatever we're calling for a clothesline, the thing that's holding up your tent, this piece of rope. And all of a sudden the sandstorm comes, so your clothes are full of sand now. Picture being at the beach and putting your, your bathing suit, you know, full, it, nasty place. Um, when we first got to Saudi Arabia, the, um, the population there, they don't allow their women to drive trucks. They wear those, uh, I forget the name, where you can only see their eyes. They wanted us to wear those things and not be able to drive our own trucks. And I, my job was military intelligence, and I drove a five-ton truck that became an office, an expando land, 10 by 10 by 10 van, and that was our office. So that was my job. But anyway, luckily, they, the Army said, the coalition forces said, they're part of us. They're very much, we're not, they are going to drive the trucks or we'll go home. It's just that simple. And so we settled into our routine, 12 hour shifts um, on our, on our, um, what we did for recreation. Um, there was books there. Um, but a lot of times we played board games, those same boards with the, with the, uh, we actually did war games. For fun. Whoa, <laughs> so, uh, showers. Yes, there were showers. It was an immersion heater, so you had a piece of couple of um, ply boards put together, so you're you're sheltered. And but the immersion heater is on top, and so it's probably maybe thirty gallons, but it has some kind of device in it that heats the water. And so whatever it takes for that water to come down. That's your hot water. So it's about 30 seconds, right? <laughs> there you go. But anyway, it, it almost turned out to be a hassle. You just kind of did a uh, best cleanup as, at, at, the, at your tent area rather than. Um, it's just a nasty place. And a lot of us are sick from, um, well, you got parasites uh, in the sand. The sand is very, very thin. Uh, light and it actually gets into your lungs and then my lungs are uh, compromised they have uh, with my immune system it actually encapsulates them so that they don't spread that you can breathe so I have these little spots all over my lungs and they just watch them to make sure they, they, they don't grow um, 
but um, one third of us that went there, over 700,000 of us, are sick or dead. Uh, depleted uranium, and in order to fire a tank, the ammunition, you actually need that. Um, and it's not necessarily the bad guys. They lit the oil, the oil fields on fire, and so you lived with that, the soot coming down for, I don't even remember how long that lasted. Uh, but anyway, it was camouflaged so we could find out what was going on. Um, they gave us a number of different shots all at once is the main problem. Um, say malaria, um, that now we're finding out wasn't even FDA approved, malaria shots. Um, you can actually look this one up online. I, I forgot the real name for it. But um, they actually gave us something called PBT tablets again. So this was for the biological warfare that they anticipated. They gave us these pills to take every eight hours that had not been FDA approved. They were using us as guinea pigs. Some of us actually wore deep collars you'd put on um, for mosquitoes that you put on a cat. This is not good. Um, so, um, a lot of us didn't even know we were sick for a number of years. And then I knew I felt like crap. I was retired and I, um, I'm not sure when I really started listening to everybody else talk on social media. I'm thinking about 2012, something like that. So I've been out, you know close to 10 years. And I'm finding out that not everybody, everybody has a lot of the same symptoms that's wrong with me. Like I have no energy. Like when I get done with this today, there'll be nothing left of me. You can't even ask me to get off the couch after this. I've had a full day. I'm usually done about two o'clock. Nothing's left of me. Um, so chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, the aches all over for no reason. Um, sleep apnea is a real problem. In my case, I have complex sleep apnea. And what that means is it's not only the regular obstruction, say, if somebody's overweight or something. Um, mine actually is a problem with my brain. My brain doesn't necessarily always tell me to take that breath. And so I actually have a machine that breathes for me if I, at nighttime, if it, it pushes air. CPAP machine. <clears throat> so um, how I found out about all this was I, I saw some things on, on social media, but I also heard about, it's called War-Related Injury and Illness Study, and it's located in um, New Jersey. It's a VA, but it's research. And so I talked to all these things that were going on with me, the VA here, knew nothing about. They didn't understand it. They think it's, they think it's all in your head. And um, it's not that they didn't want to help me. They just didn't know what to do. And so I actually ended up going to New Jersey, and they kept me for three days, and I had a whole team to myself. Um, one veteran for three days having this whole team to herself. And when I left there, they gave me this report on recommendations that my home VA could do to assist me. There's no cures per se, but it made life bearable. And I used it as a blueprint. And so my primary care and all the different specialists followed their protocols. And um, the other thing was it, would, it was documented for the VA purposes, so I got service connection. If I hadn't gone to the risk, I wouldn't have been service connection. So. Um, Anyway, I still follow those things that they recommend. Um, for instance, I, did, I didn't have the diagnosis of sleep apnea, so I didn't have a machine. Well, no wonder you're tired if you're not breathing correctly at night. Um, so um, that kind of thing. For, so you have 100% service-connected I do. disability for medical reasons. Do you also have PTSD? I actually am 100% for PTSD alone and 80% in addition for medical, but it's all still 100. They got that funny math going on, but for medical conditions alone, physical ailments, I've got 80%. And how did you document the PTSD? It wasn't easy. It took me 13 years. When I first started going to a mental health provider, and it was far after I had uh, 
retired. I retired in 95, and I think I started seeing my first, uh, it was a grief counselor. I thought that the fact that I'd lost my son, uh, I was in a grief, a grief group. And it turns out that it was only the tip of the iceberg, that it, military sexual trauma, the combat-related trauma, um, my childhood kind of things, that all, all were all part of a bigger picture. But one of the reasons it took me so long, in all fairness, to the VA is that um, I can present as if I have my stuff together. And so that's not good to go to the doctor and you look like you're perfectly fine until you have this breakdown and you fly off the handle and um, end up in the Looney Tune bin. Um, and I'm not big on their meds. And so again, that kind of hurt me that if I refused to take their, their uh, meds for depression or anxiety, that I elected to do alternative medicine, which I, I can talk at length at if we have time sometime. But anyway, um, so it took me a long time to get, they actually, when I first started going, they called it an adjustment disorder. That's one of those things that a lot of women got that were kicked out adjustment disorders or personality disorders. And then it was just anxiety. And then it was uh, depression. So they kept changing the diagnosis. One person actually said I had a borderline personality disorder with cluster B um, tendencies. Well, I looked that up. That didn't go over well with me. <laughs> that's somebody that's batshit crazy. <laughs> uh, and so I actually had a fit. I fired her. The, the psychiatrist. She didn't even talk to me about the diagnosis she was going to put in my record. And I demanded that it be removed. Now, I, and I suppose it's never really going to be removed, but it's not the one that pops up now. It, what pops up is PTSD, MST. So when somebody sits down for you the first time, they know that you've got these issues. Um, the, the VA is ignorant to... Uh, for instance, the, so it took me 13 years to get the, the PTSD. Part of it was I would get this intern. You know, they, they practice for one year. You, you work with them, and then they leave you again. So then you start every time with this new intern until somebody said, you need consistency here. You're never going to get any better if you don't get a real doctor, a PhD, and somebody who's going to stay with you for a period of time. And... Um, so that finally happened in 2013. One of the interns uh, actually gave me the diagnosis of PTSD, and the weight was lifted off my shoulders, that it wasn't a fight anymore to prove that I had these issues. And from that point, I've been able to focus, okay, this is what's, this is what's going on with you. There's days I can't leave my house. There's days that um, I wouldn't want to get out of bed. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason for it. But the, the difference in the mentality of the VA, and I went to a homeopathic doctor, that doctor told me that what's going to happen if you don't leave the house today? So I'm going to take you out and shoot you because you're not worth it? He said, what does it matter? But if you, what you were to tell the VA doctors, then you're over, what's it called? Overphobic, where you wouldn't leave the house? Um, so... Um, I definitely have bad days, but I have much better days now. You mentioned um, combat-related trauma. Can you talk about that? I can. <clears throat> so my job was military intelligence. And I would brief General Franks, who was the 7th Corps commander. And so my job is to know what is out in front of him so he can take the right machinery to eliminate them or breach whatever they need to be doing. Um, so, um, for instance, if he, if he knew that there was uh, tanks out in front of him, he would take Apaches to kill the tank, the tank killer. Um, so, so that was my job, and I did it. I was in from November of 90. There was the six-week um, 
air war and then the three-day ground war and that was been my my main job the three-day ground war but it was all in preparation we were there figuring all this out trying to figure out these units and um, anyway so after the ground war was over I went to the site where they were trying to get across um, the Tigris Euphrates River and there was a mass destruction there was this line of and I saw what I caused I was the targeteer. I told him to do that. And I was like, oh my God. It's like, it's no longer that war game where you're moving around that tank. I saw the destruction. I saw mangled tanks. I, I would be in a tank and there'd be live grenades still there. The bodies luckily had been removed. I don't know how much time has passed. But the whole idea for us doing that was to verify our intelligence, to find out what that unit was. Did we say that they were right there? Or where'd they come from? And, and that's what, that was our job. But it actually affected me in the, I was responsible. Oh, Did you feel guilty? Definitely. And again, I wouldn't say I knew it then. It, I would have horrific nightmares. And again, this is one of the reasons why I didn't get the PTSD, is my nightmares wouldn't necessarily be combat related. It was always destruction. It was a car accident. It was somebody drowning. It was somebody, somebody being stabbed. It was somebody being mugged. Mass, like rolling off the hills of a ravine, going into the water on a bridge. It was always that theme. I didn't necessarily know them. So they couldn't pinpoint that it was combat related. But if you think about it, I caused mass destruction, that's, that's exactly what it, and I had no control in every one of those. It was like me looking through a crystal ball, watching something else happen. Um, Did you feel like your actions had violated any kind of moral beliefs? Mm. No, I don't think so. Have you ever heard of moral injuries? Oh, before? sure, sure, yeah, absolutely, so you yeah. I don't think it was that. Mm. Well, killing somebody else, but it was our job. No, I don't think so. No. And so these symptoms started uh, manifesting after, yeah. after your service. Yes, definitely. Drinking, um, relationships were always a problem. So I dumped him like nine years in the service, but then I went through men like they were going out of style, um, and I kind of like he rotated. <laughs> he did this. Peaks and valleys. I, I did that every 18 to three, three years with men. I did not hold relationships. I either got bored with them or they were drunks or I didn't drink it. I, wait, I need to back up. So I didn't drink until I got out of the service. Well, so you didn't drink I, no, I gotta just, um, I'm mixing things up. I, I do this just a second. Okay. So my husband drank, Bill. I did not drink during that period. I divorced him and I became the drunk. So I was uh, the good old boys network going to the NCO club, uh, right hand man nights. So I was either with the first sergeant as his uh, superior or my troops were with me all drinking together. And um, so alcohol became a problem, big time. And so one year out from my retirement, um, so in 94, I went to my first sergeant. She was one of my drinking buddies. Um, I said, uh, I want to stop drinking. And so in, we determined that uh, we were going to try. It was track, th track two. There was three different tracks. Uh, track three would have been like in-house 28-day kind of thing. And so they, we tried the um, going to meetings, 90 days. Yes, yes, absolutely. And then there was this other group of sorts and then that's when things got um, when I stopped drinking things got clearer that that things were really bothering me because I wasn't being um, self-medicated that things I could figure out what was really bothering me and why I was drinking so you didn't describe your drinking not as like social or going out but rather like habitual daily oh, oh yeah I would either stop my traditional thing was I would stop for a 40 one bottle of 40 ounce, like at the regular grocery store. So 40 ounces. That's, I don't know. I did that daily. Or if I had a six pack, the whole thing was gone. At, and I basically uh, fall asleep.
drunk. Beer, or liquor. It's just beer, yeah. I wasn't big on wine or or. Uh, Hard liquor. No, no, not really. I, if I get into that, that's bad news, bag, big time. Well, let me ask you this. Um, it came up even during the, the meeting with yes. other veterans today that we're sitting in the American Legion, which is a bar on the other side. Well, actually, it's, um, it's interesting because um, a lot of people would disagree that we should be here. Uh, a lot of people won't come because it's in the American Legion and there is a bar right. But we meet from 9 to 12. The bar's not open. Okay. We just happen to be here afternoon today. Um, but yes, it's exactly the point I was trying to make is I, when I got out in, in 1994 when I stopped drinking, I stopped drinking for 13 years, um, that um, I didn't want to be one of those people that said they were going to go fishing and was at the VFW. And so they might have done 30 years and they didn't last a year from the time they retired. They didn't know what to do with themselves. So I reinvented myself. I had a plan. Just like I had a plan when I went in the service, I had a plan for what I was going to do for the next 20 years. And I basically did it. The, the only biggest problem I have is my, my medical conditions kind of made it um, like I'm, I'm right now. I'm 62. So, I, but I've been retired a couple of years. So I kind of accelerated it by a couple of years, and I honestly don't have a problem with that. I think I worked enough. So, do you feel like you know, kind of the culture of drinking and veteran circles is, is difficult for a lot of people? Definitely, it's actually. I think it's still the same. They say maybe not, not the returnees now, but. It was a culture. You were expected. If you, if you know, the first sergeant would have thought I was a stuffed shirt or something. I wasn't one of the boys. I grew up in a man's world. Um, it, um, I would have been exiled, so to speak, if you, you know, if you didn't do it. Um, not that you have to get sloshed, but they would. You would be expected to go have at least a couple beers before, you know. Um, so. Were there other? Addiction problems? I never did any drugs. Nope. No Still pills. none. No. no, no, no pills. No. I, I, I am very in tune with the addictive personality, so to speak. Like, I'm right now, this could potentially be addictive in that I'm all about the veterans and advocacy and I'm putting my heart and soul into this group, that kind of thing. I spend a lot of time. My husband doesn't get it at all. But um, you, you sparked. An interest when when we started talking about the incarcerations because there's too much of it. There's major injustice going on here. One of the things that Felix and I we will go back to this, but when you talk to Felix, I want him to talk about Doc's Hotel. He was very upset with me today because I intend to talk about Doc's Hotel at some point because I have mixed feelings about it. And uh, but anyway, it's it's just one of those places that supposedly is taking care of the veterans when I wouldn't live there. Never. But it's keeping them from being homeless. Um, I, we got off on a little tangent here, but there's a, uh, there's a major problem. Uh, can I, let's follow this tangent a little bit. Okay. How did you get involved in advocacy? And veterans? It was all by default. It was all about me getting the help I needed, figuring out all the red tape. And now that I know it, if I know that shortcut, or I just told Barr something that he didn't know today, um, that to follow through. And I'm a, if I know something, I want to spread the word. And so um, somebody might say, what about, you know, would you mind talking to this person? And I'll strike up a conversation. I don't know how many at least four, maybe even more, that did not have any service connection at all before I started talking to them, and they're 100% today. And that's life-changing. Basically, couch surfing, a drunk, whatever the situation is. I don't really know many people who've been in jail, per se, except my ex-husband. But he's a perfect example, I'm telling you, that if anybody just followed him, that he would be a different person today. Um, so, 
it was by default. I don't have a, I guess of my calling. I don't know. I was, so um, I had troops under me for 20 years and I was a, a leader from, from basic training, like the squad leader. I was the person in charge. I, it was just my personality. They saw something in me and I, I got up through that. Uh, even if I didn't have the rank, I was still bossing people around. And, um, but anyway, so when I got out, I wanted to change that personality. So I don't try to bark orders. You might have seen some today, but um, I try to talk normal talk. I, it was like, I, okay, you're not, you're not in the army anymore. You, you can't just boss people around. But anyway, so I had another bad experience with another man. It turns out he owned bars. Now I'm not drinking. But I was with him for seven years. I came home to upstate New York, and he owned six bars. And I managed three of them. And it was like 90 hours a week. It was, it was more hard than being in the Army. But anyway, as a bartender, it, there's something about a female bartender that has more control over the men in the room. Not sure what that's all about. Either they respect me because I kind of look like their mother. I don't know what the story is. But I well, I it was a nice bar that I ran. If anybody got out of hand, they, they were out the door, no questions asked. Um, so indirectly, I see my members of the bar being part of the family. I was looking after them. If they'd had too much to drink, I call their son and they come home. So, so I'm still a caregiver, so to speak. Um, so you kind of sick them to that role and what better right. in this group. Right, exactly. That's exactly can, what happened. Can you talk a little bit about, because I know that today that you had a, um, like a, a prompt, a writing mm -hmm. prompt that was based on oral history. And yes. So everyone prepared kind of a, a three-minute thing of what they would talk about if they were doing Correct. an oral history interview. Um, can you talk about storytelling? Do you guys get together and often to Times exchange stories. We, we do it every Friday. So this is a regular thing? Right. And it just happened to be the prompt today for, um, I didn't want to give away what you wanted to talk about. I just said, you know, if you had a chance to tell your life story, what would it look like? But it would be prompt, like it could be as Memorial Day, it could be, um, but what we've been doing with them is, um, so they get five minutes to write, and that's not enough to write anything. It's just normally, but they go like, and then we all share and we give each other feedback. There wasn't a lot of feedback in the circle today. That would not have been normal. I was pushing them today. Um, there's normally a lot of feedback interaction. How, how does it affect you as, as both a, a storyteller and a listener to engage in that experience with people, to hear um, what I'm sure are difficult memories? Mm -hmm. uh, one woman express grief and sorrow and, and despair in her story and that was very moving for me absolutely and, uh, is that can you talk about that oh yeah absolutely it's very healing it's uh to be in a group and somebody i i related a lot to what was said today uh especially with the women um bar surprised me i had no idea about his story um but anyway uh but we do this every week and this stemmed from the VA. They used to do creative writing. And, and with that, though, they pulled out different traumas, like they were really opening wounds. And unfortunately, they didn't care for those wounds at the VA. I try to pick topics that are um, not so sensitive. Or we get into stuff, but um, by accident, I guess. But to me, I love Sandy's storytelling, she, and we're actually working on developing into dramas. So there might be a great story that comes out of this event, and we, we don't stop there. We, we, we're going to put it on stage. Um, so I get a lot out of it. Uh, in, so every morning, Felix and I, I talk to him before I talk to my husband, 5 o'clock in the morning. And so I asked him about this Doc's Hotel that he lived there and I wanted his perspective and I tried to give him my perspective. And, and so that, like I have a false sense of what happens at Doc's Hotel. I think it's, it's short. So, so by me listening to him, and the good thing about that is 
he's actually clearer writing than he is talking. So we get a lot done if I like easily talk for an hour on whatever subject needs to be talked about that day. I'll be gardening with him tomorrow. Like we have a garden together. So um, I think, did I answer the question? It's very healing for me. Is it also oftentimes difficult? Does it open up wounds for you? It gives me, it, it, yes, I suppose it does. Only I try to look at it if, if it surprises me, then I need to take a better look at myself. Like there was a point there that I didn't get somewhere along the way. Um, and I have, the, the thing about this particular group is I have to be patient. We've got some talkers. And I have to be patient not to, um, you know, we've got some delicate folks here. And, but they're here for a reason. So it's a fallback that I'm kind of in charge. I've tried to give it away. I've tried to say, well, I, how about if we, I'm not necessarily in charge. We're collective as a group. But they won't take it back. <laughs> they won't. Um, so. No, I'm very interested in that because oftentimes I, well, as you know, I, I record people's mm -hmm. stories and oftentimes they're, they're full of trauma. Yep. And I know whatever feeling I have during that, it's their lived realities every day, yep. right? So I yep. like to think that there's healing involved in it, but I also understand it can be harmful. Yep. Um, so I, I want to make sure that everyone on here who has access to counseling services the um, the backstory to this group that you were in today is we all went Felix Tufauer, I and Aroma all went to the VA three days a week we had art therapy music therapy individual therapy recreational therapy creative writing creative expression so we had classes from 9 to noon, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. And then in January 2016, they stopped everything. And so what happened was a lot of the people went home, closed their curtains, and didn't come back out. Some people ended up in the psych ward. The place where we were supposed to be on a Tuesday uh, Felix only came on Tuesdays, for instance. That was his day to get out of the house, to, be, to actually work with his hands with wood. And they, they took it away. And some people decided they were going to fight the red tape, that they were going to call their congressman, they were going to um, go see the, the head of the VA, got absolutely nowhere. Um, they got mad at me because I wouldn't fight that fight. I thought it was going nowhere. Um, so what I did was, you met Rob today. He was in the circle. He's kind of quiet. It was right next to me. But anyway, he is actually uh, part of peer-to-peer uh, -peer mentorship in, in Rensselaer County over in Troy. And um, I, went to, I went out looking for a place where we could meet instead of the VA. Just that kind of thing where we could kind of replicate or just get together for coffee. It was, I thought very small, a coffee clutch. This thing is ballooned to nobody's business. Um, but um, so I asked uh, heroes at home, and I didn't feel comfortable just going off on my own. Penny's going to do this. I didn't feel comfortable. I wanted um, to be under an umbrella of uh, a nonprofit. So I reached out to him. He said he, he would gladly, um, you know, they were already meeting at such locations. So we had two locations over across the river. And then this is fairly new in the last year. Um, and they're phenomenal, these guys. Um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of money across the river, but they have no problem with paying for the music therapy you saw today. We do paint and sips. We do horseback uh, horse therapy, uh, equine, um, kayaking. And we became, this particular group was called Arts for Vets and much, much more. So what we did was, the way in my head, the way it is, is we're still under the umbrella of Heroes at Home over in Troy, Rensselaer County. But in Albany County, we are actually a committee within the Zaloga Post, and it's called Support Your Troops. So, um, and, and so when I'm doing these, these writing prompts, that's what we did at the VA. 
So it's, it's what we're used to. And then I bring different things, and I've gotten art supplies from different locations. I big borrow and steal, <laughs> ask for donations. Uh, where do you think that your drive to, to help other veterans or support or lead these support networks comes from? I guess I have apathy. I don't. I don't empathy. Empathy. Yeah. I. Uh, I can tell you that. I was so mad when I left the VA, but I think it was actually the best thing that ever could. It was a crutch. I was, I would go there three days a week, and I'm doing, I'm doing everything that they did over there. So, it it was good for them to kick us out. Not everybody should have been kicked out, but in my case, it it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was like an enlightenment. There's no reason why I can't do this. <laughs> I led you know all these soldiers to battle. I can. I can take six to ten veterans and put some art projects together. We actually have art shows, displays. We just had a huge one. Yeah. So the drive. Just, I don't know. It gets me out of the house. It gives me the motivation. It gives me something to do. It's my job now. It's my job. I heard someone mention that they didn't want to go home. Oh, today? Yeah. Yeah. Is there like a... Yeah, they did. Something about home, like being by yourself, or, or being well, nobody to talk to, nobody just to enjoy somebody else listening or not listening. It does kind of be present. Mm. You don't really have to say a thing. Yeah. And then uh, I guess I'm kind of responding to to what I was listening to yeah, earlier. Good, good. But uh, uh, one of the women said that she didn't feel comfortable whenever people thanked her for her service. How, oh, does, that, how does that make you feel? I don't necessarily take them seriously. It's rare that people do because I don't wear the hat like the guys are always walking around with their right. hats. Um, if I happen to be at some facility and we, we are wearing our shirts or we have our hats on, then, then people might. But what happens normally is I'll go up to the guys wearing the hats and thank you for your service. I happen to be, you know, retired army, something like that. And they'll say thank you for your service. So I guess I think we're second nature. They're not really taking us seriously. Oh, you know. Um, Being a woman? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you have any kind of um, reservations about identifying as a veteran whenever you got out? Um, I guess so, yes, because I didn't want to be. Um, I didn't want to be in the category of the guy on the bar stool. I had no intentions of having anything to do with veterans. I was now a civilian now. It was a whole sever the ties. So there's still too much of that association, veterans groups with drinking. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And um, but again, that changed, I guess, when I started asking for help. When I figured, when I realized there was a problem, when I started going to that those counselings, um, like I said, it started off as gr grief counselling, and then it turned out that there was all kinds of um, mental health stuff going on that needed to be dealt with. So Trauma processing. All of the so grief kind of brought to the surface the yes. underlying problems yes. for you. Yes. When was that? My my son died in a car accident in 1999. Yeah. It was horrific. I actually did a drama last year on it. I, I did like a police report, but it told about. I read it as a reporter. Um, but that's the kind of this, how I deal with. Um, I did a dramatization of me finding out about. Him being wrapped around a telephone pole. How old was he? Nineteen, and he had just joined the service. Um, he was gonna, so this was in February, and he was leaving July sixth. So he didn't, um, he didn't graduate. So you said that you had stopped drinking for mm -hmm. um, thirteen hour, years. Thirteen years. Mm -hmm. Did you start back drinking? I, yes, I drink now. Um, so what I like to say is, and sometimes I get more than I'm supposed to, but I, in a perfect world, on Friday nights, we have date night every, every Friday. And I usually have a couple beers. 
what we found is, my husband and I discuss this on a regular basis, if, if the beer's in the house, I'll pop it open, like when I come home. If it's not there, I don't care. I don't think a thing about it. It's just, it's most, it's like a, you'll find I'm, I'm always got something, I've either got coffee, I think it's like a, um, uh, anyway, I usually have coffee, water, I drink heavy water, or uh, beer. I don't drink any kind of other alcohol. Um, in service, I, it was always Pepsi. So I was on a constant, you know, so self-stimulate, self-medicating, basically, right? So, um, but I can't say that I don't necessarily overindulge or, um, like I said, we, it's just better that the beer's not even in the house. When did you meet your current husband? Uh, we've been together since 2007. We met online, match.com. Yeah. And it was, we got along immediately. Is um, yes, Coast Guard. Oh. Yes. I asked him if he wanted to be part of your project. He's not interested. He's not a trainer. He actually goes to the Dunkin' Donuts every morning from 10 to noon, and all those guys sitting around there are veterans. <laughs> well, I, I do have a, a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talked earlier about your experiences with MST. Um, I know that one out of every three veterans in prison are there for rape. Um, I know that you know, each year annual reports indicate in the tens of thousands of, of, of victims of sexual mm -hmm. assault in the military. Um, one year, for example, there were 20,000 estimated. It's one out of three people in the service that are... have been victims. Yes. What do you think? Why is it? I wish I had the answer so I could fix it. Uh, the mentality? Good old boys network. Uh, I I just recently learned about all the guys being raped. Um, I can't imagine being on a tin can for three years and they're only guys. Um, uh, so part of it is we don't report, so nothing can be done if you had a chance to have it done, and then. For the most part, it was covered up, or it was something that was expected. Um, well, what do you expect? You're a girl on on base with ten thousand. You know, you put yourself in that predicament. Or God forbid, if you you actually had alcohol involved, so then you became the then you became um, promiscuous. You asked for that. Um, you were out drinking with the boys. What do you expect? Um, and then years ago, there was. I'm not sure. I, I've been out f over 20 now, so I don't really know with the discharges now. But they were, um, two things were going on. That, so those personality disorders that they were putting out like candy. So if somebody had reported a rape or they went AWOL because they didn't know what to do and they got depressed and whatever, so that's they were discharged because of that. It wasn't from the fact that they, they had actually been raped. Um, and then the guys, turns out, there's special codes. Up until 1975, on, on a DD-214, they would put a special code that, that your employer would know what that meant. Um, something like, well, it might have something to do with mental illness, but it was like um, not, be cut, not appropriate for a military service, so they wouldn't hire you. Um, but there was all kinds of secret codes that was going on. So when the guys came back from Vietnam, they had major codes and they have no idea that they ever had them. It's just coming to light now. So it's the system. I, I swear, so not everybody goes from the college to the military, but there's a problem on college campuses. The whole thing is the same thing. Those frat parties that go crazy and they think they can just do anything they want to do and then blame the victim. So I don't have an answer. Do you think that there is something in the culture? Like of definitely hyper-masculine men thinking that they can exert their power on people who are... Yeah, it's women on women, too. Right. 
Um, but yes, it's definitely in the culture, definitely. So my daughter had just gotten out of service, and so I asked her, if she, you know, the been anything. She just told me the other day that um, she never had any problem. But the bottom line was, she was just as strong, or she she didn't take anything from anybody. That they knew that she wasn't somebody to be. She got along great with them. Only it wasn't you didn't mess with her. They, there was. Um, You've heard of the form hormones? Um, they can smell fear. And that's the honest God truth. They can predator and prey. They know what's going on. It's huge. So oh it's definitely the culture. It's I, I again. So I was in the Women's Army Corps. That was from 1943 to 1978. Was there rapes going on then that we didn't know about? Or were they safer because they were on a, another compound? And so my, my, I'm really thinking maybe we should. Re, if I think this is my thought, that if women wanted to join the Women's Army Corps or some kind of auxiliary, they should be allowed to. If they want to go to combat, then they should join the army, or be in some kind of special elite SEAL unit or something. I think you should have choices. You don't have to. I have no interest in being on the front lines with. I was 70 kilometers back, and that was close enough for me. I don't have to prove anything. What do you think that the public should understand about the experience as a veteran um, coming home from the military that they might not think about? I think civilians are clueless. To include your VA doctors, because they're not necessarily been in the service. Mm -hmm. And they're treating you. Uh, they okay. So what they need to understand is that each one of us are individuals. Don't stereotype that because you've been overseas and you were deployed that you know PTSD might be a major issue in your life, or um, or things like you're on a plane and somebody somebody has a meltdown of sorts. Be understanding to them that there might be something going on, that you don't know the background on that particular person. Um, uh, veterans need, there's this huge problem with transitioning. Even in this small little group we have, I have to tell them it's time to transition. We're going to stop music therapy, and we're going to do uh, the oral history. Um, we have a terrible time deprogramming. They taught us how to be soldiers. They don't tell you not to be a soldier anymore. That's a real problem. We actually did this wonderful program. I wish we could do more with it. Is um, uh, there's a person with um, down in New York City? He works with Shakespeare, and he came up here. And there was 13 of us. It was Saratoga. He actually does a play. It's called Wreak Havoc. Phenomenal. It's actually coming back the 26th of July, I think it is. But he actually wrote this play, and it's, he has PTSD, but he took Shakespeare's words and made it his own story. And so what he taught us was that when Shakespeare was talking about all these people in Macbeth, that they went out to war, they left their families behind. Families changed when you were gone, became more independent. Then all of a sudden, this the soldier's back, and you're supposed to be complacent again. Um, so he helped us better understand. A lot of people didn't like Shakespeare, but they were talking about us. And so we actually did um, dramas um, where I wrote my own drama, and I incorporated it with Shakespeare. And um, he recorded it. And it was a, I, I really think drama's a huge thing to be help out with trauma. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. But so the point I was trying to make about that is he gets it that civilians should uh, civilians should see his play. The bottom line. <laughs> so they, they should educate them. Yes, they ed get educated. To yeah, so right. I, I really like how you said don't generalize veterans, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they're not all the same. No cookie cutters. Uh, you mentioned family again. I just so what. 
what impact does the military service have on family? I know that's a super broad question, yeah, but you can yeah. just answer it any way you want. Well, they're obviously part of, the, part of the military, very much part of it. If you don't have a good, stable environment at home, the soldier's not going to be able to do his job. Um, when he deploys, you know, the wife's at home and she's keeping the home fires burning and the kids are still in school and they're still happy and, you know, daddy's coming home, that kind of thing. Of course, I'm generalizing, right? It's the same thing. But they're so important, and the, the Army does understand that, that they have these groups, the support groups now for people who's, who are staying back. Um, family members are, are huge. Even if you're a single soldier, which what we try to do is get them out of the barracks and bring them into your home so that they're part of a family. I always did anyway. So you'll see that a lot. Do you consider this group part of your family? Oh, absolutely. How, how does the group support one another um, and how do you respond to loss? Uh, I can see it today where uh, Two Flower really wants to tell her story, but she's scared to death. And I had told her that, you know, if she ends up telling anything or recording anything, that I would, I would be right here. Um, just me being in the room, I don't have to be holding her hand or anything. But so she sat, she stayed behind, but that actually influenced Felix because he's the driver. And so Felix supported her so that she felt better about the fact that she, do I want to do this? Don't I want to do this? Or, you know, um, she tends to sugarcoat things, though. It's unfortunate. She's got a story to tell, though. Let me see. Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. You're okay. you're answering all of my questions. Okay, good. Uh, how do you deal with a bad day? For the most part, I'm ba I I beat myself up. <laughs> um, if I'm having a bad day, I'll say to myself, and this isn't the right answer, um, what's the matter with you? You know, pull your bootstraps up. You can do better. There's no reason why you shouldn't have gone there. This happens to me all the time. My husband tells me this. So I sign up for this pro program, this project, right? It's 7 o'clock at night. I don't go out at night. But I, six months ago, I signed up for this. And, I, and I'll say to him, you know I don't want to go tonight, right? He said, but you signed up for it. I just signed up for it if you didn't want to go. So I have to I have to push myself out of the house to go to this. Like the, the Shakespeare thing. It was seven seven weeks of me leaving the house at seven o'clock at night and coming back at like ten o'clock at night. If I'm in Saratoga, my I'm that's not, I'm not that's not my territory. Um, so that was a push. But it was important to me that I think there was something to get out of it that was important to me. So that's not necessarily the right answer as to if I'm having a bad day. The right answer is everybody has bad days. It's okay. Forgive yourself. Uh, maybe write about it. What's, can, is there anything that a lot of times you can't pinpoint? I can't pinpoint it. I wake up evil. So if I happen to be able to pinpoint one thing, then I might be able to journalize it or write it down. Um, I do a lot of writing. Not necessarily journaling. I, I do a lot of writing, though. Um, we submit them to Veterans Voices. I forgot to tell you that. So when we're doing these group things, and we actually have a nice collaborative thing, we actually it's, it's actually a magazine that's published nationwide. And uh, I've been published many times in that. Um, and we, are, we all work for the Creative Arts Festival. It's like a year-long thing that you, you create all this uh, music, drama, creative writing, art, and dance. And you have these competitions. And we do it. Well, you know what you should incorporate into it. What's that? Oral history. OK. You'd be a great oral historian, I think. Um, how do you mark success? Uh, waking up in the morning, <laughs> uh, <Fair enough. laughs> getting out of the house. Okay. It can be simple little things like that. Um, I my I consider my uh, career a success, um, um, but simple things are just to me. I I have a very simple outlook on life now, you know. Um, 
going to the gym. I know that my body feels better if it actually works out. I hate working out. I, it was one of those things I stopped in 1995. But I know it's the bit, I'm, I'm a member of the Y, I'm a member of Planet Fitness. I sign up for these things and it's a matter of getting out of the house. Once I go, I'm fine. But so I had to actually pat myself on the back because I did cardio this week. Right. It's simple, I'm telling you, it doesn't take much to <laughs> please me. <laughs> um, how do you define patriotism? I think it should be shown every day. It's, it's the love of your country. The United States is so important to me. Everything I do, I want to be able to be, I want it to shine through in me. Um, I wear a lot of outfits that have the flag or say if I'm a member of uh, organizations. Um, I don't wear the hat so much, but anyway. Um, but being loyal to your country. Um, now, when I joined, I wasn't necessarily going to be like, I, I want to serve my country. I was, I was a naive kid. Um, but I'm glad I served my country. I am very proud. Uh, we meet a lot of veterans, and they're veterans. They got two, three, four years. It's rare you find, especially a female that did 20. So um, I go to every Friday morning, Right before we come here, there's a Patriot, oh, the, the thing at Gateway Diner. They're all Patriots. So they're not necessarily veterans. They, they, it's part of the uh, honor flight. It's called the Patriot flight. And we meet there for breakfast, 8 o'clock. They usually go to 10, but I have to leave early, that kind of thing. But we're, you know, we might ride the um, Uncle Sam floats, or we're out there in the community. Is there... Uh Anything throughout this interview that you wanted to talk about that you didn't ask about or that you want to go back to? I think we need to talk about like the incarceration piece. Um, I think I'm very fortunate that I was never incarcerated. I did some wild and crazy stuff with mainly drinking. Normally I wouldn't just do stuff just to be doing stuff. Um, you know, knock down drag outs with the ex-husband that's trying to um, hurt your babies. Um, um, there's such a fine line. I just didn't get caught, you know, drinking and driving. I remember, I think it was a promotion ceremony for me, and I actually had to, my two children in a car when I was driving the wrong way down the street, and they said, Mom, and I made a U-turn and fixed. That's, exact, that's exactly when I said I'm going to stop drinking. Because how am I any different than the ex-husband? endangering your baby's lives. So they were four and seven. And um, something like that. I lose track of it. It all mingles together. Um, so when I was talking to some of the people after they wrote this stuff today, and I said, I want you to be honest with yourself. How close, maybe you've never gotten in jail, but how close were you to be incarcerated? They said, oh, so close, so lucky. And, and I would definitely say that it had to do with uh, not getting the treatment that they needed. A lot of people won't ask for help um, or not accepting it. Um, my ex-husband, for instance, is a manic depressive. So what I've learned is they kind of like being high. It's fun out there, right? They don't want to come down with the meds so you're just everyday Joe. Um, so he, he would be non-compliant with the VA, wouldn't stay on the meds. In fact, he was if he would be compliant with his meds, we'd still be married. He was a nice guy. It's just that he's just crazy every once in a while. Every once in a while, every three years. So um, so you got this transition thing that needs to be addressed where you actually have to follow a veteran out, out of after the service. What's happening with them? Assign them to a social worker. that You just send them home um, and hope that they... Uh, they make it out okay. Um, the homeless population is awful. Um, and a lot has to do with the mental illness. Um, but um, so then you've got these halfway houses. I wanted to talk about Doc's Hotel. Now, 
I don't necessarily want to talk bad about it, but what it is is, think about the 1950s when you had these little cottages, and then you had like a restaurant, and then you would go to the restaurant for breakfast, and then it would be like mom and pop place, right? Well, anyway, well, what they've done at this Creekside Docks Motel, it's called, I actually looked this up, I know the lady, I met her, because I, I try to deliver craft kits down to her veterans. So according to Felix, there's about 20 veterans there, but some of them are really in bad shape now. So they've probably, they've definitely, probably Vietnam era, and they've been so comatose with medications that they do that shuffle thing. And so every morning, the VA brings a van, so they go away, from 9 to 3, they go to a day program, it's called, and they sit there like zombies. And then they come back and eat, and then they have this room. Everybody has this room. So back when, so what I was hearing from him, and he's going to give you some clarification on this, is he left in the 1990s. They were charging him, a veteran, $1,000 a month for this room in the 1990s. I would be willing to bet that they are taking all that money, the service connection, probably over $3,000 for them to have this little bitty room. She might, she provides the, she provides the meals, three meals a day, um, but they're all alone. It's not like they, they might be sitting around in, in their comatose state someplace. Um, but, okay, so if I don't think it's the best place for them, the other option is being homeless. So what's better? I was talking to another veteran over in Troy the other day who lives in some place called Fawn Ridge. It's assisted living facility. He hates it there because they dictate his life. He said, I would rather be homeless and off my meds than to live at Fawn Ridge. So I don't know how many times he's been in and out of these type of facilities. Um, so we definitely don't have it right, whatever we're doing. I don't have an answer, only... It's something's not right. Thank you. You're welcome. Two more questions. Okay. Right I'll write up uh, What are the worst and then the best aspects of humanity that you personally experienced? Hmm. I would say the, the worst part of humanity is lack of integrity. Uh, I actually find this in veterans sometimes. Stolen valors. People, we have somebody in the group that, uh, I don't think she's a veteran. I think she lies right through her teeth. Um, so that's awful to me, to say you were in the service. And she told me she used to uh, fire an AK-47. Please. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, the best of humanity. Um, there's a word, I'm trying to think what the word is, but looking out for one another. Uh, what's the word? Uh, I'm not, I don't know, but the, that's the answer. Ever one another sense, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. Yep. Supporting people. Right, without being, again, it's a fine line without damaging your own self. Mm -hmm. Keep your own integrity. You can, you can try to help too much. You can be, uh, that's what I was doing with my marriage. I was trying to fix him, and he couldn't be fixed. Or it wasn't my job to fix him. Right, codependency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you want future generations to learn from you? I'll be strong, that women can do anything they want to do. Um, don't let anybody tell you that you're not worth the salt it took to plant you, as somebody used to say. Um, have good self-worth. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you not only for your service to your country, your community, humanity, but also for sharing your story with me and to communicate about your world. Thank you. Appreciate your time.